I just wanted to say welcome and um, again, I guess at this point, uh, just uh, to have uh, a little bit of a trace uh, of who's here and who's um, and, and what school board, but I guess uh, since we're a small group, uh, just out of fun, uh, for fun, you could, uh, we could go to Wook Lab and just write your, um, your names, if you don't mind. Well, I just put the link in the chat. In the chat, yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah, perfect. It, it was scary to see my name. They were, what, what? No, no, no. <laughs> but this is fun if you have it in a class, like everybody, you'll, it'll form like a cloud, you know? Yeah. So just to uh, to keep, uh, you know, it's fun. It's just, I find it like a nice uh, introduction. Wow. I'm Micheline Amar. Uh, I'm going to be your host and presenter today, but I am surrounded with an amazing team. And of course, our Julie is always like the spotlight. <laughs> so Martin and Louise, merci Louise to be here. Um, these are my, my consultant team, my curriculum consultant team. And I have Julie, Nicole and Richard is my nice tech team. So without uh, my whole team, this would not be possible. So I'm very, very thankful for all of you to be here. That being said, now I'm gonna go back to the agenda. Um, we're gonna start, of course, with a little survey, okay, at the beginning. Um, we're gonna go an overview of geometry, probability, and statistic program. Uh, not to the, we're gonna be, we're just gonna have a, like an overview of the program. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, what is a clear math goal so you could target learning. Um, introducing a hands-on activity in class, suggestion of GeoGebra activity in virtual classroom, lots and lots of resources and uh, interpretation of the, uh, of the survey and an invitation for action. Okay. All right. So if you don't mind, I would like you if, to take a few minutes to, to just to do this, this fun survey. Sorry. Um, this fun survey, because we'll get back to it at the end. I'm gonna... All right. So we're good. All right, super. So hopefully by the end of this uh, this workshop, we'll have uh, we'll see the importance of math goals and target learning. We'll recognize the benefit of visual, uh, visualization, and you'll have access to a huge collection of uh, in class and virtual activities. Now let's take a look at the um, the overview of the program. So when we look at the over the, the program, uh, of course we we're all familiar that it has uh, the CCBE and the DBE, which is of course it's cycle one and cycle two. Um, what in the CCBE you have the literacy presec sec one and two, and of course the DBE uh, has the sec three, four, and five. Uh, but before we start looking at the courses themselves, um, there's a history that, that is attached to these two, um, the separation. And uh, historically, um, Monsieur Martin Franca was, was giving, well, he was like um, making me aware of it, that historically the CCBE program was designed for, for students to come and have a, a good foundation in math literacy so they could get on the market. So once they finish SEC 2, they would get out and they'll find jobs like in Hydro-Quebec, in Bell Canada. So there, there was a lot, a lot of jobs in that. So they needed that basic education, like ba that basic literacy to be able to find a job. Uh, the DBE was designed back then and still is uh, if, if you wanted to finish your degree and to keep on going on to a higher education. So the thing is, with times, as you may know, now graduating with a SEC 2 uh, will not get you much, but it still has its purpose for, for I guess, some, some people who needed to review their literacy. Um, we are teaching this program uh, right now to prepare our students to get to the DBE. And as you may know, looking at this list, the only time that we see geometry and we see um, Statistics and probability, if we're looking at only the cycle one, is only in sec one and in sec two. And I know some centers, they don't even teach literacy and pre-sec. So these are the only two courses, like one course in, in the cycle one uh, of geometry and one course of the, in the cycle one of stat and uh, probability. And the next time you actually get to see them is in sec three, four, five. And the jump between sec Two, like if we look in term of geometry to the sec three, if, if you taught both classes, you'll see it's super huge. And there's a there's um, there's almost like there is a gap. 
and 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 fortunately it's uh, it's design um it's design with that flaw so uh recognizing that gap we'll we'll have to we'll have to kind of fill in the blanks for for our students to jump in from two to three so um that being said in in a later workshop i will be doing um i'll, I'll be doing a comparison study between the, the the youth sector and the adult ed sector and 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 give provide you with the list of all the the things or all the topic or the concept that will fill in the gap for the adult ed so this is something that i found when when i taught the sec two geometry and i taught the sec three geometry in sec three i was like the reviewing sessions were teaching new stuff. So um, that was a bit frustrating. So if that was, let's say, brought up, was brought up sooner, <laughs> these students will have easier time and actually probably more success in the three, four, and five. And I don't know ab about uh, your centers, but the SEC5 CST is uh, the probability and statistic course is not taught for some reason. And it had almost been, um, kind of been changed for the financial uh, course. So um, I don't know if that, that holds in your centers. I, I just teach the sex five, uh, the high, the SN. Oh, the SN, which is, which is the cases in a lot of, a lot of centers. Nobody, like not nobody, I shouldn't be saying nobody, but a lot of centers teach only the SN. Uh, very few teach the CST math. I think I've only heard of one teacher, David, doing the uh, CST math because he created the the pretest at Sonia's workshop. Yeah. For it. Yeah. Oh well, I, I'm sure he's one of the few. Yeah. Because uh, when I've been going around asking, like the the, the school the centers, uh, asking them if they actually teach uh, the Sec Five CST, and a lot of them don't. It's just because they find it a huge jump. Uh, the, 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 they're trying to avoid, I don't know what it is, with the statistics and the probability course in the SEC 5, they're trying to avoid it. And, and rightfully so, because the only time that they see those probability uh, kind of con uh, co concept, they're like in SEC 1, right? Or SEC 2. So that being said, the other thing that comes into play is also the, the evaluation criteria. Now it changed, right? It changed from a knowledge base to competency base. So that br brings up another, another, um, another uh, challenge uh, in our preparation too. So uh, looking at this, um, the knowledge dimension, this is the knowledge, uh, the knowledge base, which was the old program. It was, it, it functioned in such like you, it was more linear in a way. So you have factual, conceptual, procedural, and the metacognitive, that was like the, the, the cherry, you know, those are for your strong students, you know, the self-knowledge and the strategic. It wasn't very thought. It's more like, let's get the right answer. We have an outcome, uh, like um, we need to, 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 to get to that point. Point. We need to test the students. There's a right answer. Let's get to it, right? Now, that being said, now with the competency ways, we're looking more at cognitive process dimension, which means, of course, now we're trying to, to, to uh, develop a, a more action-oriented um, way of thinking. You know, we're looking more like from the, the remembering, understanding, applying, that was more like a, like the, the, the targeted outcome. And now we're trying to, to use more the critical thinking, the meta metacognitive, which is the analyze, uh, analyze, evaluate, and create. Now, that being said, that there's this study of, um, in France, there's this uh, P Dr. Antoine Baudet, Took, took the, uh, the taxonomy and reformatted it in, in a way that actually will be more use, uh, use for the teachers. And uh, he did it in such, um, in such a way that he actually classified, uh, classified uh, uh, he regrouped all of these, um, these, uh, competency, these level, these mega, metacognitive levels into groups. And these, how they came about the competencies, C1, C2, C3. Right. So like, for example, knowing and recognition, understanding, applying, creating and evaluating. The minute you start looking at D and E, you're talking about like the, 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 the more uh, 
higher cognitive, uh, metacognitive uh, competencies. And if you're looking at more like knowing, recognizing and understanding, those are on the lower, but you need, it's all interchangeable. You don't, there's no order in where you should start or where you could start. You could start somewhere and you could flip and flop between these, these uh, levels. Now, the minute you cross them together, and this is what I found, it's super interesting. Let me show you this in a, in a larger format. So you'll see, you'll notice over here, you have the knowledge, uh, the knowledge dimension, and here you'll have the metacognitive dimension, right? So these are the competency uh, way of doing things, and this is the knowledge-based way of doing things. And when they cross, uh, you'll get a more complete way in actually bringing up the, the student to, to be a better critical thinker, because you do need both, both dimension to have a whole wholesome, if you want, uh, way of looking and uh, way of looking at things. So uh, when we're looking now, if you pay attention, we are moving from a, a noun, uh, a noun um, descriptive way, an object, a target object or a target objective, to more um, to more a learning objectives. So it's a huge difference. Now we're starting to use more action. We want you to determine, we want you to criticize, we want you to analyze, we want you to create, we want you to reflect, versus we need to get the students to uh, like to, to master a certain skills. So uh, having that, um, that diagram, it made me kind of realize we're, we're just adding another dimension to what we were doing before, which is, uh, which is something that we were not brought up in. And I, I could refer it only to myself because I'm not going to date myself, but I was more, uh, I was more brought up in the knowledge dimension. So I only know like there's a right answer. So developing these competency for myself and to teach it, it's not something natural. So it, it, it requires a lot of thinking and a lot of getting out of my, my, my comfort zone to do that. Okay, and, and another way of looking at it also, this is based on the Bloom taxonomy, except this is a three-dimensional look at it. Okay, so far so good, any questions? We're good, okay. So again, now bringing back this to the classroom, and of course, all these students need to resolve problems, right? So what are they evaluating on? So the interpretation, representation, model, planification, resolution, and reflection. If you read the program, these are common uh, words. You'll see these common verbs you'll see for, uh, that are connected to competencies. And these competencies, once you understand them and the, you break them apart, then you start saying, okay, that it's not the, the, the it's, not a, it's not a solution that I'm looking for. Really, I'm working on how to get the students to to think on how to get to do something. So this, this is a different game changer. So what is a strategy? This is another term that I come across often and, and we see, okay, what is a strategy? A strategy is just an approach to finding a solution, right? It is similar to choosing the right tool for the job. If you're a plumber, you're trying to screw a bolt, which tool will you use? There's many tools to actually solve the problem, right? So the tool you choose depends on the problem. So here, the strategy, you'll have many, many strategies to solve any problem that you have, you know, any problem that you have, but the right strategy to solve whatever problem you have will, will, will depends, right? Some strategy will work, will work better in one way versus another. So these are uh, what we call math strategies that are, um, that I actually searched and I found. Uh, that are used not only in math, that they're used across the board, like um, in all, all other disciplines, like science and, and languages and arts. And, uh, and, and again, when we think of a strategy as a tool, so a tool could be used in different, in different uh, location, right? So visualize, experiment, using table, making lists, logical reasoning, find pattern, and working backward, all right? Now, how do you guys teach geometry? If you, how would you go about it? How do you go about it? You could write in the chat or we could just talk. I think your question is pretty broad since there's so many things about geometry. So are you asking us if we use manipulatives or if we, like, are you asking us what 
what type of resources we use is that what yeah you're like asking? yeah how, how do you how do you bring it to the class do you introduce it like uh, more in a theoretical way you you well obviously it's a mix right but how what would you find what works better for you when you're teaching geometry uh i like hands-on the most with uh, manipulatives in the classroom okay. it becomes a little bit more different uh, or difficult when you're trying to use manipulatives over a Zoom classroom. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I, I used to have a Geo Sketchpad. Now I think it doesn't exist anymore, but no. I used to really like uh, that software. So now I have to readjust to new software. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, that's the way I, I like to approach things. Oh, OK. Uh, and, and Paul, what do you do you teach geometry? Yes, what I'll say, what I was typing is uh, I, I teach math resource uh, just one day a week. So I'm dealing with students that are in real difficulty. Mm -hmm. And so then I like to use like whatever tools I'm adding to my toolkit. This is new for me this year to do math resource and trying to find a way to like take a step back from the topic a little bit and like manipulatives or whatever I can draw on the board and just using creative ways and sometimes trying to guide the students step by step in a direction to see what they know um, and just really focusing on the visual aspect of things and touch and feel when possible and mm -hmm. see what they know and then try to bring them to the next step. Yeah. Well, and, and you, Jessica, do you follow the same uh, method? I, well, I... For me, my, you know, my class is always individualized. Mm -hmm. So I, I adapt. Uh, some people know and just need a review and some people struggle and we have absolutely need to draw it, cut it, flip it for them to be convinced that, okay, it is the same or, or things like that. But um, I actually have not successfully teach geometry in online yet. Mm -hmm. My one and only student gave up. Oh. Uh, but I, I may have to try that again. Mm -hmm. And I'm planning to use uh, GeoGebra. Yes, yes. And yes. manipulate it and record myself ma manipulating it. Yeah. And yeah. then hope, but I don't know if I can expect the, uh, the, the student to use GeoGebra because they're quite complex. Yeah, yeah. I'm still learning GeoGebra. It's, it's been like weeks. <laughs> Well, well, just to let you know, geometry virtually is it's very, very difficult, but there is lots and lots of tools. You're right. You're right. It's just figuring out what tools work with different students and working out uh, you're, you're matching you're matching what you're trying to to like, what's the idea that you're trying to convey in different ways? Yeah. And, and think, it's, it's challenging. You're right. You're absolutely right. I know I can record myself because I don't have a document camera or nothing, but I know a uh, Microsoft whiteboard, mm -hmm. which I have access to just with a Hotmail, mm -hmm. will allow me to, to draw my triangle as if like with, protract, with a protractor function, with a ruler function. So I can still guide and to draw a triangle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, then seeing the results, well, not seeing the result because it's over Zoom, et cetera, it's, it's going to be a mess. Yeah. Well, you're going to see today, today, uh, Louis, well, Louise had taught me, if she could teach me in like five minutes how to operate GeoGebra for a few things, I could tell you, anyone could learn. I am uh, one of the, <laughs> I find it very difficult uh, to, to learn all of these, uh, all of these um, technology all at once. Personally, I, I think as a personal choice, pick one that works for you, learn it well and teach. Well, you know what? You'll be surprised how your students sometimes may teach you the tool more than you will know it. And you know what? That's OK, because if if you this is maybe like if you want to say if it's the carrot, you throw it out there and you learn together. So that'll be something that you'll have in common to bond over, you know, so the math becomes like secondary, but the point is you don't want them 
like like you'll say we'll discover it together so you'll do it as a joint effort so i had students when i tried something new like that i was like i was so worried that i wasn't able to to explain or show but they were able to show me and explain to me most of the stuff that i wasn't even like i didn't even think about and and they gained confidence through what they just learned and the math became like just part of the equation but but um I know it, it's sometimes finding the right the right formula. It's it's a bit challenging, but I mean, there's nothing to lose. You throw it out there, and and you see if they they they, they bite and they learn, right? And you'll be surprised. Uh, younger, well, the students are are much faster with this kind of thing than than we are, you know. So, but this this is where it brings me to the next point here. Sorry. Um, when you're looking at these strategies, before I wasn't aware of these strategies, to be honest with you, and the more I, because I had a bit more time, you know, to, to start investigating and looking around, then when I saw all of these strategies that I could actually put to use to the students, I realized that I did not know as, like, I, I needed to work more on developing my strategies and like, like exactly like Paul said, you have students who have difficulties and you have to like really say, okay, what do you know? And now what can I do to make you understand? So we all like both, like we bend forward and backward to, to, to help them understand, but there's actually strategies that we could use. And, and some of them probably, are better with some students and than others. But the fact maybe to to try them all, that might be a good thing and let the students pick the one that, you know, finds best for them, right? So I don't know if you ever used any of those in your classrooms. It's kind of, it's difficult not to use them. Yeah, but but do you, do you show the same problem with different ways? Depends on how the student sees it. So if we, for example, working backwards from area to radius, they're like one way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Certain certain things you just pick the way that it works. Uh, but if you know, for example, if you're trying to help them understand what a radius is according to a circle, then you can visualize. You can make the experiment with the length and then divide. And so there's all these different things. But it really depends on the topic. Geometry is pretty broad, so. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes it helps to use one or two and sometimes with just one, it, it just hits the note. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, it's funny you mentioned that, Julie, but um, I, I actually attended a workshop where somebody was like had them all available on the board to the kids all the time. And whenever, whenever, like you said, like you use one in a certain situation that is that is suitable but you could try another way but they always had them there so they always reminded the student that you had access to all of this right and of course uh, of course us as teacher we just just second nature for us to use different techniques or different strategies but to them to the students they're not aware of we don't name the strategy we use with them right so this is something that I had to kind of correct on my end, but, uh, but there's no right or wrong anyways. It's just a, a, learning, uh, a, learning, uh, a learning way to make it better for everybody. But notice that our competency is actually, it, this, is, this is like a heavy load of grades on this, right? So, um, all right, so what, one model that I actually researched a question? Hi, yeah, sorry to interrupt you. I just, going back on what you just said, I think it's really important to show the students um, that they do or remind them that they do have strategies. So oftentimes, like when I work with teachers, um, many of them like to, to create like a template for students to help them along through the problem solving process. And sometimes we see that it, there'll be an area where it, it reminds students to use your strategies, but if you list a variety of strategies that they can choose from um, that often helps as well because they're not always aware of what the strategy could be mm -hmm. and then when you remind them you can you can draw a picture to to help you you know to depict what is being said in the words mm -hmm. um, it's just it's an approach so like that teacher that you saw in your workshop that they were they were keeping the list of strategies on the board I think that's a great idea whether it's on a board or, or on an actual problem solving template 
thank you, thank you, Sonia. And 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 this is exactly because it made me reflect on myself. Because honestly, uh, from a personal experience, I I'm more comfortable with one or two really, and these are my go-to all the time. And you forget that this is my my go-to, but it may not be the the students go to, you know, and sometimes like, like you work with the students so many ways and like, you're like, I don't know why they can't get it, but because I, I'm doing the same thing over and over really in a different way, but it's the same way. Right. But if, if I put these, the, like having it around in the classroom also to identify what we're using, um, it's a reminder for us to, to say, okay, we tried this and this, maybe let's try this or this, you know, and, and get to the students by verbalizing, say, well, I really like working backwards. So you have to give me the answers for all the next handouts and, and, and I'll figure it out, you know, because I notice also some students, they cannot move forward if they don't have the answers. And to them, it's like such an important thing. So I don't, I don't, I don't hold back the answers anymore. I'll just give it to them and say now, okay, perfect. Now show me how you get there. You want the answer? I give you the answer. Show me how to get there. And this is the part that they find not so fun anymore because now they have to leave me traces and they have to show me how they get it. So that's where we get to another type of strategy. Okay, this is a template. This is what's supposed to be, what's expected of you. But this is all taught because we don't think about, like, especially when we get to the evaluation rubrics and we see them like so lengthy and so extensive, if we actually prepare the solution already in that format, it will become less lengthy. And I know that sounds like idealistic, but really <laughs> it's a lot of learning curve for everyone, even for us too. It's not second nature and I'm not gonna lie to you. Like sometimes I just go and like, this is the problem, this let's solve it and let's call it a day. But then I go back and I say, okay, if I have to correct this, I missed half of the correction. You know, uh, all of these points are not mentioned, you know, and this is what we need to go back and kind of revisit is if it's trained during the class time, how what's expected as a full answer that on its own put our students in a very successful position because we're taking away from like, OK, let's solve, let's solve, let's solve more into like, OK, how would I go about this? which is, I think is, is a lot more beneficial to the students because they're moving from one level to the next and eventually they'll get it. They'll eventually get it. So, yeah, thank you. These are, this is another, this is another strategy that I came across, which I thought it was super, super interesting because I, like you, we do it, but I don't think we ever had a name for it. And, and when I had, I want to start looking for the research and seeing, uh, how useful it is then and then i brought it up and actually i i start calling it you know uh cra is is um is an evidence-based ba uh, based math uh, instruction method strategy where everything throughout all your discipline you can use it to turn anything into a concrete format and once you have the concrete format in place then you represent it the abstract part comes only at the end OK, so what does that mean? If you look through um, like look through elementary, like um, the growth, the, the growth first, a child has to crawl, then a child has to walk. And eventually the child has to sit and do all kind of movement. Uh, mathematically is the same thing. They start off by discovering sizes, uh, touching, feeling and all of that. Then they move up to like scribbling and making um you know making shapes and all kind of weird form and eventually later on we teach them that it's a one two three right so the same idea comes to teaching math altogether if you uh, provide the opportunity to the students to actually manipulate discover play with something and then once they figure out a pattern or make sense of whatever like those manipulative then you could bring in the representation part which most of the time we skip because we want to jump right away to the abstract part make sense of that math right or we have to put these formulas in place the the lettering the number and the symbols is the last step in math teaching based on this this um, evidence-based uh, strategy so the way you'd look at it is you usually uh, approach match teaching or learning in a concrete format, which make uh, prepare the students with an experience with, the, with some sort of connection to it, uh, if they're uh, physical or virtual way, then 
must this is the step that we always miss i find personally i could talk about me personally uh the representation part if i want to show something i bring them to a lab or i give them an activity and then i'll skip the representation and say okay we had fun with this now let's go and let's make sense of it what did we learn and then we start right away with the formulas and stuff the representation part based on this study it's when the student actually internalize what he just discovered he is trying to 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 bring something that he sees experience and make sense of it to himself using drawing diagram tally so he's kind of almost synthesizing what he just learned and once you synthesize then you could communicate it through the abstract part that's where you put your numbers and symbols to make sense of what you just understood so um this is this is something that uh, maybe we should just be more thoughtful about um and use uh, the benefit of this model you remove a lot of language barriers you show uh, the student understanding or not right um it's an extra toolbox so you know that the students who have difficulty expressing themselves they might just rely to a drawing to uh, you know point forms those are the, the the guys that you know they, they do understand it's just they cannot put it together fluidly in in a in an explanation format but they're good they're they're, they're able to explain it in a different way right so, and of course, uh, this is where you could bring in, once you start presenting your models, then you could have the opportunity to, to have math conversations, math discussions, and math discussion and, uh, and, and exchanges, that's where the magic happened because people are actually look, analyzing and, and thinking of the other students' work. So there, there, there's a lot of conversation, why did you do this? And what's the logic and what's the idea? And that's where you actually, if you listen to these conversations, uh, the learning is happening and of course stimulate creativity there's no limit you're not putting a limit right um ideally this is where we want them to to get at when we're using strat a strategy um students are at different levels in their learning of strategy and i know um Ideally, we would like them to use the strategy to communicate detail on how they chose it and to show the solution in many ways. And they're able to, to describe, to draw, to, to make sense of it. This is uh, in terms of how to use a strategy. But of course, uh, how we could build this comfort or this efficiency with the strategy, uh, we could start off by just maybe get them to recognize the tool they're using again like we just talked before like naming the tool like sonia was saying like having it around so they could name it first uh by by naming it making sense of it then you could use the tool use the tool as uh making uh to make thinking visible so now we're starting to experiment with different tools so i'm comfortable with one tool but because i'm comfortable with one tool i know i'm gonna get the right answer with one tool but then i'm gonna build on that by it taking a chance in different strategies different tools because i know i could kind of compare all right but then once i'm comfortable with this my my toolbox kind of just got expanded and when my toolbox expanded that's where now i can i know what to what tool to use when right and eventually now i could use the tools to express what i need to express but this is of course this is when our students are masters in strategy use and this is hopefully where we want them to go right any questions so far I just wanted to add that, you know, like one of the things we, we really need to teach the students to do is to always show their work and to go through the representation phase helps them after to, to leave the traces that they need to show how they came up to with the, the solution in the end. Yeah. yeah. And as a teacher, it allows you to see the thinking process and, and then intervene more specifically on maybe where you see some gaps that happened. Yeah. Yeah, um, the the there's studies right now on on all of these strategy being expanded in levels. Once the once that um, document gets put together, I will bring it to you guys because it's it's done in the United States. They're trying to use this kind of this kind of uh, if you want uh, uh, study in group in pilot group and see if the students is able to move up using strategy, using uh, thinking tools, using uh, what 
like they have a lot of studies going on in terms of like how would they combine competency with strategies so it's it's very very interesting and not only geometry in, in arithmetic and algebra and all of that stuff now this comes down to honestly all of this the strategy and and the student success comes down to really having a math goal to target the learning to if you have a clear math goal in mind then of course everything is going to fall into place so if we take a look in terms of what the teacher is doing and what are the students are doing they have to work in synergy right so if we take a look over here establishing clear goal will articulate the math right uh, it will guide the lesson plan it will guide the the unit it will guide the learning progression all the uh, activities that you choose will be only aligned with that goal. So uh, all the strategy you, you will use will be all aligned with that goal. That from an instruction perspective, from a learning perspective, if you notice that there is actually a visible timeline, if you're transparent with what you're trying to do with the students, this is where we are and this is where we're going and this is all the step we're going to get there the student knows what to expect and he knows or she knows um i need to efficiently or i need to master each part to be able to move forward right so there's no surprises the teacher is not going to throw at me something new and they're part of the learnings they may come back and say well you know what at this point i'm not comfortable because i'm missing something else so this is where it becomes more collaborative all right uh, and also you'll get to 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 connect with the students in term if you're always listening and all the activities that you're doing is synchronized with your math goal. Uh, the students will have a tendency to implement the 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 activities that you're you're presenting the interest right and they'll they'll implement the level they're at too, so you can adjust your teaching. Okay. So to of course. Uh, to have a, a, a math goal to target the learning, we need to, uh, of course, like Nicole was saying, we need to obtain evidence for the student thinking, right? So, of course, effective teaching of math use evidence to to kind of have a building ground where you want to know where your uh, where your student is and where you're going. So that formative assessment is continuous. It's not necessarily it's not necessarily traditionally only when I give a pretest or I give a quiz or something. The students is constantly being evaluated ev all the time and you will notice the leap and bounds or you'll notice the difficulties and you keep track of it right and having that uh, like for example an exit ticket or um, a morning question or it could be in an activity form or maybe in a discussion whatever it is like this is how you pick up the the traces but um, on a, on a, and you could provide the support, right? So, so we can make sure that that they're followed and they're they're nurtured to keep on trying. Um, this is this is again this is based on the same concept. There is levels of of how you could show your work, and we know our students are actually placed at different levels, right? So if we take a look um, at level one. And it could start off simply, I can ask a question to help my work, you know, uh, level two would be, uh, I can find a correct solution, right, and you move on to I can show my work so that a reader understands without asking me a question, and eventually I can show more than one way to find a solution to a task. So this is developing um, how a student could grow in showing their work. It could start off with simply like, you're giving me something, I'm questioning you to, to explain. And now the next step is like, you see that feedback that I'm questioning you? Now, next time I'm gonna have to question you less. Let's try to aim less question. So he'll be able to kind of transcribe it in a way that, what would the teacher ask me? Would she ask me any question? I have to give her an answer where she, everything is there that she won't ask me anything. And having that in mind, he'll progressively improve on how he or she, of course, um, give the, the, the scribe, show their work, right? So ideally, uh, and that's where you could kind of come in and give them strategy on how alternative ways of actually showing their traces, their work, okay? 
Um, of course, when we're talking again, another another technique is to facilitate math discussion, and that is by peer teaching, exchanging of ideas, uh, peer discussion. Uh, uh, Personally, I would put a problem on the board and I'll put them in group and I'll say, okay, you guys put your solution on, on a whiteboard, on a small whiteboard. And once you're done in five minutes, everybody puts it up and we're gonna see each other's work and see why do you think they're correct or not. And have that conversation and, and have all the, the, the board displayed and get the students to go to one board to the next and have that conversation. And the person defending their ideas or not, it's not, it, it's more like the the why and how, what did they think, like what, the, what were they thinking when they got to that um, solution, right? And this is where usually I find the magic happens. Um, of course, this is, this is a bit, uh, usually, um, this this method is a bit difficult. Sometimes I find use and connect math representation. Of course, this is not a natural way of doing because sometimes it's straightforward and easy. Sometimes it's like you say, well, how? I never thought about it. There's always a way of, of uh, representing uh, a concept, right? But there's different way of representing concepts. So this is where I find if, if the students have includes this step in their learning. This is an extra step that they will have the chance to internalize the learning, right? And, and by internalizing it, then they'll be, the minute you start representing it, the minute you're starting to make sense of it, and if you wanna take it a step further, that's where the communication come, go and teach it to someone, have that conversation with someone. So you're, you're, you're activating all your senses to, to, um, to, to digest whatever concept you're learning. And that's where you know there's more deeper understanding of the idea. All right? Mm -hmm. And of course, now this is where the fun part is. You start implementing more tasks and promote higher metagognitive reasoning. So this is the part that you're gonna start introducing complex situation. Now you taught it all individually. Now you're giving them a complex situation and now the students have to put everything together. Of course, the first complex situation should not be a very difficult one. It should be progressively difficult and, and not necessarily difficult in language, it's more difficult that in term of when we're talking about complex situation, we're talking about the context itself it shouldn't be difficult. It's more how many steps it's required for you to get where you need to get. And of course, this knowing this will build procedural fluency from conceptual understanding, right? So the more you do it, the better you become at it, the more, the more difficult, like the more rigor you put early on, the smoother it'll get later on. And that's why usually cycle one is, is where a lot of the teaching and the pedagogy come to life. That's where the teacher had to uh, exercise a lot of creativity, a lot of strategy, a lot of learning. So, because you're in the learning phases on top of it, of, of their, uh, their learning, if there's any learning difficulty or if there's holes in there, like uh, like my colleague would say, the Swiss cheese, they come in with like, they're they're perfect, but there's little holes here and there and they're learning and we, we need to kind of fill them up. All right, so what's really, really important in establishing um, math goals to focus the learning is to have a very clear goal to be able to, 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 to not to make it too complicated, to have it very, very clear in simple words, and also to locate the goal um, at hand on a learning progression. So kind of to display it, say, okay, we're here. This is the goal to get to here, to get to here. This is the next step. So they could visually or, or know where they're going, mentally know where they're expecting to go. And of course, the goal is to guide instruction decision. The goal guide that kind of decision that you need to uh, implement. Uh, now we get to the fun part. Now the hands-on, this, this is the fun part, is that's where the hands-on part come in to fortify this kind of learning. And um, before we, I introduced to you the first um, complex situation that I created or like the project one. Uh, do you have any questions, please? All right, um, so I would like to show you um, a hands-on activity that I, I've done. 
actually all these activities that I put together, I actually have them um, tested. I actually had them done in my class. All right. So um, I had them put on the, um, the website and you'll get them actually um, at the end in a booklet. I have a good 26 page booklet. So I'm gonna show you the three of them. We're gonna skim through all of them in terms of ideas, but I'll show you what I actually did with the students, okay? So this is, um, I love to do cross-curricular um, project. So the whole idea here in, um, in my class, this was, if I'm not mistaken, was a sec, two, sec one, sec two project, if I'm not mistaken. It was like more with the sector because I had them combined in the same class. Uh, at our, my center, when I taught this, we don't have uh, literacy and pre-secondary. We only had the, the, the cycles. So, um, and they usually combine one and two together anyways. So what we did is we said, okay, our, and it's true, our center did not have a library. So I gave them a little bit of context. So, okay, you don't have a library and we would like to encourage reading in the school. So what about if we do a little library? And if, if you're not familiar with this, this is a phenomenon that's going across actually North America. You'll see people out of nowhere, a little box with the library there and people would leave books, wouldn't take books to encourage reading. So we said, you know what? Let's build that concept in our center. So I gave them a purpose. So we need to build a library to encourage the students to read. And the procedure is was very clear, filling up the library with books through donations to your, you know, now everybody is getting rid of their, their books because they want to all go into virtual, like uh, into online kind of books. So we'll collect these books, put them there and people will just take one and will bring one or not, whatever. I mean, the whole idea is like just to promote it, to have a place where you could access to a book. So this is the interesting part. This is my, uh, this is my uh, mischievous side. So we had a whole discussion in the class. Okay, what are we going to do? So there's a planning phase. Um, I transformed this section into questions. Through a conversation among the students, then you could ask them, okay, what kind of question, what do we need to know in the planning phase? So what information you need to know to be able to plan and design your library? Where can you get it? Who can you get it from? Is there any constraints uh, um, in designing it? Is it gonna be outside the school? Is it gonna be inside the school? And if we're doing it in school, we have to go see the, the principal and say, well, where can we put it? So there's a lot of kind of um, things we have to think about before we even start uh, start the the, um, the building and the, the designing part. So uh, notice that this is more like the cross-curricular. Uh, then the brainstorming here, the ideas of the library. Now where we get in groups and we say, okay, uh, how are we going to do this? What does your library look like? So they start drawings and uh, making ideas. Uh, how can anyone access the book? Okay, is it gonna be like a pool? Is it gonna be a door? Is it gonna be open? How is it going to be? Is it gonna be just shelves? These are all thoughts. Uh, is it gonna be outside or inside the center? If it's outside, it's gonna rain and snow. So you have to think of that. Uh, how tall is it going to be? Is it gonna be my height, your height? Is it accessible to everybody? People on a wheelchair, children, uh, short people versus tall people. These are all thought that they have to think about. So. Preliminary drawing, that's where they get into, I made it as a group project. So here each one will have to sketch their thoughts, their ideas, and among themselves, they'll have to pick the best sketch that they think will represent the group. Some teams, they took a piece here, a piece here, and a piece here and make their own. Some decided to, to just pick one and that's it, that's all. So that's up to them, that's their choice. Now, again, the compare and, and, and select, uh, this is where we, we, we go through the, the, the analyzing part. Okay, so is there similarities? Is there differences between the individual design? This is where I come in and I teach them what is a Venn diagram, what a table. So I give them strategy here to, to actually think about it. And I collect all of this. This is all their work in progress. And finally, the selection of group, the preliminary design. Now we get to the prototype. There's some research. Uh, you have to measure different sizes of books, the weight of the books, these all come into play. Uh, research online for an ideal little library dimension uh, should look like, you know? So again, here, think of a student's average height, accessibility, and what material would you like your library to, to be built with? This is an interesting one because 
I thought personally, knowing me, the, the, the material is going to be just what we have access to, either uh, um, wood or cardboard or some sort. But some students came up with like recycled furniture. And that I thought was like, they blew me out of the water because I would have never thought about it. Somebody wanted to have an old fridge where, you know, remove the door and have the fridge and put bookshelves. I'm like, that is super clever. I would have never thought about that, right? So this is where their creativity exploded. But we had to still contain it because it's in a school, right? So the other concept that you could bring in here, budget, right? Uh, is there a budget to be respected? Do you need to have a budget proposal? If I had a group that wanted to build stuff, so I said, no problem. Just give me a budget because I cannot you know, give you a, whatever, a credit card and say, go have fun, right? So you have to give me a, but a budget proposal. And that's where I thought that you need to get quote from different stores. So this is really real and applicable. So if this is a project they would do at home, it, this is the process that they'll have to go through. So it became really relevant. Now the drawing part, of course, the 3D, 2D, and the, the 3D, this, this was me pushing the envelope because I know at SEC2, they're not, they don't need to, <clears throat> they don't need to, but I thought it would be for the ones who were interested, that was an opportunity. <clears throat> then we get to the building part. There's the security part. <clears throat> oh my, my. Um, then I asked them for <clears throat> a list of tools they need a list of material that they need, and if there's any expertise that they need. So that means what? If you're cutting wood, obviously in school, I can't cut wood, right? So we have to go see if we have a technician or if we get to go to Rona and get the wood cut, right? The building happens, inspection, testing, paint, decorate, fill up the library and present it to your principal and to your teacher and publicize it to the school. And I promise you, it was such a wonderful project. It's tedious and it's frustrating. And at time I kicked myself in the butt for doing it, but it came around and actually they were so proud of it, <laughs> you know, and the learning that happened. And the concept that we brought in into this project was incredible, was was more than I what I was thinking. Like, like we start talking about tolerances, which is not even part of the course. You know, we're talking about technical drawing, which is not part of the course, but they were so interested. They didn't need me to tell them, right? So they went above and beyond. So this is one, I'm not gonna go through all of them the same way, but I'm gonna just show you like thoughts. Of, of, of project and you have access to all of this so you could use whatever you want. You can modify it, you can make it simpler, you could turn it into a complex situation. It's your call. This one here, I, I actually we had an endeavor group in our in our school and we I thought of building like vegetable boxes for them to actually take care of uh, during the summer. So I put it in a context here. So we said we wanted to create a community lunches once a month. We collect donations from our um, from the businesses around, but we had to contribute something by building these uh, these garden vegetables. And we went through the process the same way. And actually, we built we built these guys. And it's it's actually they're they're uh, they're at the school and they use it. But I, my intention was to build one every every. Uh, semester so we could build a few over time but uh, we managed to build one only so that's for that and the third uh, project that I uh, actually tested and that is actually a really really fun one it's the um, my dream room what I did here also I said okay you're getting a new apartment you're moving out or you're just changing an apartment not necessarily moving out and you have to design a space and we go through the same kind of questioning the brainstorm the the, the 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 drawings the finalizing but what's the twist over here is i put them in group and i did them different budget right and uh, <clears throat> i chose ikea as the store because you could get access to their catalog physically or online right and from ikea's store they have dimensions of the furniture, right? 
And I give them a plan that I drew. And I say, okay, this is your plan. You pick a space. It could be the bedroom or the dining room or the living room, whatever space you want. And you design it with the budget that I gave you. And notice over here, I said taxes are included. So they have to remove the taxes and get a new budget. So there's so many things you can do with this project. You could expand it. You could reduce it. You could lighten it up, whatever you want. I actually went all the way with this. And I promise you, uh, personally, we didn't build it, but I asked them to do like a diorama. So they actually had to build the room like with cardboard. It was so fun. And they displayed it to the school and everybody was like over the moon about what they could do and how much they realized that they can't do much with a budget oh, that see, small. See. This is the three uh, situation that I have uh, available for you that you could do in person in class. Um, what do you guys think? Huge? Crazy? <laughs> I like the Michelin. I uh, particularly at the CCBE level, um, they're great hands-on projects. And the way you've divided them, you can see the link to the DBE program on, on how to get students to start planning their work and representing it in, a, in various fashions um, and then actually completing the work. You're reminding me, I, I did a similar project. Um, same thing, they, they, I asked my students in geometry to build their dream home and they started on graph paper, they made the plan. I, there is some teaching that is not part of the program that, that you have to do to get them going. So all of the symbols that you would put on a design plan had to be taught, but um, they loved it. So they, with graph paper, they designed their dream home. And then I was lucky enough, my administrator gave me the funds to buy some uh, foam core mm -hmm. and they actually built it. And then all of those typical geometry questions that you would ask, um, you know, if you were gonna carpet one room or, you know, how would you do that? And what material mm -hmm. would you choose? And actually providing them with felt that would act as carpet uh, or wallpapering the walls or putting wallpaper border, all those typical geometry questions that we see uh, in the program or on the exams could be incorporated into a project like this. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so it's, it's a lot of fun. I actually, I did it myself and, and I did it because I was, I had a very small group that semester and we were, we were probably, I think there was 11 students. And you know, sometimes when the group is so small there, you can't get any energy from them that you need that critical mass of students to get it going. Um, so because there was, I felt there was this lack of energy in the room. I thought, forget this, we're gonna put the chalk down at the time it was chalk or, or whiteboard markers. <laughs> Um, we're going to put it down and we're just going to build, we're going to go hands-on and um, it helped the situation a lot. The students were much more engaged and they too, they ended up displaying it um, to the entire school. Yeah. yeah. Once they were done. Yeah. It's a great yeah. idea. Great approach. Yeah. And you know, Sonia, I had done another one, which was, uh, I didn't have a chance to put it in paper yet, but I will add it up. I asked them to, to replicate the school on a, on a, the, we want the plan of the school. So they cut physical they got tape measure and they went and measured the school physically yes, yeah. outside and to teach scales and proportions and stuff yeah. so they were able to draw it on a piece of paper and then what i did we went to the city hall and we got the engineers at the city hall to show them how their school is drawn like is drawn on like a technical like the, the, their job the architect you know and to compare their drawing to it it was a nice. fun, it was amazing because they didn't think like what they're doing is exactly what it's been done in a real job, you know, mm -hmm. and 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 it was interesting how when the engineer went from one to the next, how he was like saying, "Oh, this is great! Oh, you missed here! Oh, you did this! You, did, you know," and they were all listening so much. It was it was something like that's where like you 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 when you see the benefit at the end. During is difficult, <laughs> but at the end, you see how much they get out of it. No, that's right. It's the real deal, right? Like sometimes yeah. when we when we try and create these scenarios on paper, they're they're so contrived, and then you can just put that stuff away and say, let's do this for real. And and you know, you've had your students make a proposal to your administrator. That is something that is done in real life in in all, all kinds of businesses. Mm -hmm. You had your students contribute to a community garden like they must have felt so good at the end of that project for yeah. being able to do that you know yeah it's um no a lot more fun and yeah if it's an approach that any of us can take in the classroom we should go for it 
Yeah. And, and actually, this just reminds me, students who have difficulties, this is their moment of where they shine because they're using other skills to kind of feel competent. You know what I mean? So if, if like, and I think I'm thinking of you, Paul, because I did have students who are very, very weak in the class. And when we used to bring them, like give them like handouts and say, do it. And they're like panicking because for them, they just can't figure out where to start, where to finish. It doesn't make sense. When you put a project like that, even it could be very, very watered down, like small, they have their artistic side come in, like they know how to draw, they know how to cut, they know how to be creative. Sometimes they forget that they're doing math and sometimes going over the hump of the fear of doing math, they're more open of, to learning. And, and sometimes a students learn better with another student than with a teacher, because we're not coming from the same background. You know what I mean? His difficulty might be, could be retention of, of information, could be, oh, I can't cut, could be like, I can't make connection. But another student may have that conversation, oh, I did this trick or tried this. You know, that open conversation from a student to another that they're going through the same difficulties. I think that connection empowers a student to try. And I, I've tried it in my class. I had students, I have a couple of students I could recall. They did their cycle one, I'm not kidding, maybe five years. And this, they're supposed to be out and about, right? And, and unfortunately, where I was teaching, it's like a cycle. Three months in, out, you fail, you go back and redo, redo, redo. It's not like open, like individual. You take the time you need to do it, right? It's the same teaching over and over and over, a different person, but the same thing. So I got the students in my class and I said, okay, I had enough, you have to move forward, <laughs> you know, you know, so what I did is when I combined them, like I almost had like a peer teacher with me with a support, we were able to to see where's the issue, if it's like manageable from our end, then we had to do other things like for example, he had to have um it, he had to have memory aids because he had executive uh, issues. He had to, he had to have uh, more support, but we were not able to know that if he would did not open up. Right? Sometimes they're so proud, also, and they had so many experience in failing. They don't want to be always the one say, "Well, oh, you know, it's another course again." You know that I know I'm not going to fail. Right? So a different approach sometimes throws them off. That's why when. In my classes, when they first come in, I don't use a paper and a pencil. I don't do diagnostic tests. Right away, I start off with something to build a community. So I take times to build that community to get to know, of course, there's math. There's always math, right? But I don't, intentionally, I make it successful. Intentionally, I, I see where they're at and I make them feel that they're capable and you know, when you're capable, then you'll take something off. But when you feel already from day one, you're not capable, then you're like, hey, I've seen this before, right? So that's why I find project like this, peer teaching, um, building a community in a class, it's so important because then they won't come for me, they'll come for each other. And when things get tough, someone will call and check on you. Why aren't you here? We're all suffering. You're not going to be the one missing out on this, right? So it becomes, it's, it's, it becomes there's more than one factor to keep them in, in engaged. So I, 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 I find the, uh, you're teaching a person, not only a subject. So this is the part where I find these, these projects super interesting. So this is food for thought anyways. I may be a bit unconventional, but... <laughs> This is how it is. And actually, just to show you something, I found somebody who've done something similar. And look here, this is this is this is the similar step that I, I had. People doing it, like sketching it, moving it into like uh, they have different design, then measurements, and then you have the sketches for every part that you're gonna cut and paste. Then you notice here the the students they're creating their prototype. They have their prototype built, different materials, right? Even to wood and then painting it, putting their color on it. And of course, preparing a presentation. So they had to put the documents together and notice over here, once this is done, they display it in the school. So this is like from A to Z, a project 
that was built somewhere else, except this person was able to keep all the traces of, you know, pictures and stuff. So uh, I, I, I just thought it's, it's super neat. There's places like, the, notice that the students, how they take it to the next level. So if I have a student who have difficulty with something, maybe they're an artist. So yeah, they'll struggle a bit with the math, but they have something to show for, right? So they'll get that, you know, we're all in a way on an even ground versus, oh, I'm weak in math and you're strong in math or I'm not smart in math and, you know. So I think those gives you the opportunity to kind of encourage these uh, these students. Now, of course, uh, the second step, uh, we, we, we looked at the hands-on in classrooms and now we're gonna move on to um, the, uh, the virtual part. Just before I go to the virtual part, uh, the project like that, just to go back for the individual, uh, individualized setting, well, what can you do with something like that? You don't need to do a project that big for the individualized setting. And I know some, some individualized setting, you have that one or two students, and I'm thinking more of you, Jessica. Uh, it's very difficult to, to fo not force or, or like kind of encourage to do stuff like that, because they, they will be like, there's no community feel, there's no team feel. But some students, you could do that complex situation over a period. You could say, okay, you'll do all these worksheets. And once you're done with this worksheet, we could go back to that project. So make it like into a long period project and incorporate the goals. So just to give them an option B. So let's test what you don't know kind of thing. It might be an option. So, um, uh, I know Julie, you had mentioned like, okay, now how are we going to entertain our, not entertain the thought of using all these manipulative uh, virtually. And uh, GeoGebra, I tell you, is, is the way to go. There's a lot of other options, but this one seems to be um, very beneficial. And I'll show you a couple of them. Personally, my uh, one discovery that I came across and I like, when Gaga over, before I go to the activity, I'm gonna show you, I'm sorry, Louise, I'm gonna, you know, let's just take a, a new document, okay? I'm gonna show you something really, really cool. And, and this is uh, thanks to uh, Madame Marois who, who helped me out. If you go to add-on and you click here, you could have the add-on of GeoGebra. And if you go here and put open calculator, how many times are we frustrated to have a, a cat, like uh, to put in like graphs into our assignments, right? So this is a little trick that you could put. If you go here on the side, notice that you have a calculator, you have all kinds of shapes and you have um, a table, but in our table is empty. So let's say if, for example, I want to put in, I want to draw, I don't know, um, let's go here and I put a function. So let's say, y equal 2x plus 3. I have a graph. Now look at this. All I have to do is insert image over here and look what I have. I have my graph. And here in my graph, I can make it smaller, I can make it larger, and it's all here. You could do it. I think this personally was a, it's a new discovery. <laughs> And imagine if you have students where you give them like, let's say graph something or, or, or use um, or draw something because you could have also the option of drawing, you know, it could be uh, lines, um, you, could, uh, you could get them to, to draw shapes, uh, you could get them to, uh, you know, project thing, I don't know. Of course, you know, and, and uh, move stuff around, you could get it like this and actually insert their work. So you could actually get their work um, traces this way. You know what I mean? So this, I, I encourage you from a teacher's perspective to play with it. It might help you a lot in actually creating uh, problems. All right. Uh, with, with graphs. So GeoGebra, this one was like a new discovery for me. And I, I was like gaga. You know, uh, the next thing is I would like you to actually go to um, GeoGebra itself. So please go to uh, GeoGebra.org slash classroom and put in this, this, um, this code. So if you create a classroom in GeoGebra, 
you would get to see all your students and I encourage you all to, to try it. It's not to, I'm not gonna test you, I promise, you know? But there is a pedagogy uh, component that I think is incredible. It's super, super cool, okay? So if you're, this, what you are seeing here, this is the teacher's view. Okay. So you're seeing actually the, the activity itself, right? So now I'm gonna ask you just for fun, try to um, try to draw a triangle. I would like you, once you try, click on more and you're gonna see all of these tools. So use whatever tool you have here to, to create um, an isosceles triangle. I'll give you a good few minutes, try it out. This is pretty cool. So imagine you give something like that to your students to do. You have lots of students and you give them a homework for whatever, like to build a shape or to create a shape and then describe their properties or to show you uh, this is an isosceles triangle and you wanna check. So let's say for example, you could go to the student. So let's say I pick Louise, okay? So I'm gonna click on Louise's window and I'm gonna see her, her actual work. So what am I gonna do? I say, okay, Louise, this is an isosceles. So what is the property of an isosceles? So we're gonna have a conversation, right? We're gonna say, okay, well, the two, uh, two, two angles here have to be the same. The two sides here have to be same, you know? Uh, so let's check. So all I have to do when I click on more, I could go to angle here, right? Well, in this case, it's already there. So she did it for me. So you'll notice I have 60, I have 60, and she obviously did it a great job, right? So now I close, let's say I go back. Louise doesn't see any of mine. So let me pick another person that I'm gonna, let's say, Nicole, I'm gonna take you, sorry. So, okay, so if I take a look at Nicole, uh, if I take a look at Nicole, uh, I, Nicole gives this to me and she said, I did an isosceles. So I say, okay, let's check. Again, the same thing. If I go and I want to measure the angle. So I'm going to measure this angle and this angle over here. Notice that I have here 66.14 and 66.24, right? Je peux t'arrêter, um, oui. Micheline. Oui. Uh, déplace un sommet. Uh, select. Oui. Je prends select. Puis... Uh, oui. Tu vois que le, le, le triangle n'est pas isocèle. Là. Yeah. Ah, merci, c'est ça. So, yeah. So, the idea here, let's say, let's say Nicole gave me something like this. And she goes, yeah, it is. I said, well, I'm going to check your angles. So, by, by checking your angle, I'm going to mention like, okay, this is 89 and this is 50 and this is 39. What is the property? So, you could have this conversation with the student and say, what is the property of an isosceles? What is an isosceles? Well, they have to have the same size. They have to have the same angle. They have, well, okay, well, let's see, do you have that? No, we don't, right? So what do we do? At this point that I'm gonna to explain to her, well, you have to redraw it or show her another another way maybe to draw it or so, say, okay. uh, I, ha I will, let's say, work with her here, but now watch this. The minute I go back to her window, none of what all the traces that I did with her privately will not follow into her window. She has to go back on her end and try to recreate everything that I taught her. So I demoed and then she has to go back and remember and try to do it by herself. So it's not like, you know, sometimes we have a student who have a difficulty, they come with a problem and you're like, oh yeah, let me show you. And they go back with the solution and that was it. They don't go back and redo the problem because they have the solution already. But in a situation like this, you could work with the students, show them how, but then they have to go back and redo it. And they don't have the traces. They don't have your explanation. They have to actually pay attention which is super, super interesting. And you can keep on going all day like this till they figure it out. Yes, Julie, you had a question. Well, it's a suggestion that you can make it a game to see who could make it with the least amount of steps. Oh, yes. I love that. I love that. Yes, yes. Competition always makes things fun in, in any classroom. Yeah, I love it. Thank you. Yes, Sonia. 
Uh, can you, um, like, I don't want to throw, throw you off your game here. Would you be able to show us how to create the actual lesson? Like, how, do you, how does a teacher create oh, a task? In absolutely, the absolutely. Too much off track or? Uh, no, 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 not at all. Actually, this is important if, uh, if everybody's okay with it. And I tell you, this was done. Again, I learned it in five minutes. So Louise is my, my backup. C'est mon uh, <laughs> instructeur, <laughs> you know. So let me see if I learned it right, okay? So let's say, for example, what you need to do, you need to go to your GeoGebra, your own account, okay? So let's go back. You go to profile. Step one is profile. Then when you click on profile, you go to create, all right? So if we go to create, you go to activity. Then after you go to activity, then first you have to start with the text. So, well, you have to put a title. So let's call it test two. Now the title in a text here, you're gonna put whatever, let's say triangle, right? And then he give you give the instruction. Instruction, right? Then you put done, right? Then you add element, right? Now we're ready to put in GeoGebra. Then here you create an applet, right? And then when I create an applet, this is what I have as a choice. You could have graphing, geometry, functions, probability, spreadsheet, 3D graphing, or notes, okay? So in our case, because I'm asking them to, to, to graph, that's great, but let's pick geometry for fun, different, okay? So now we have done, we have geometry, but now we have to go to advanced setting. And this is what we are going to limit access to the students. So what can they have access to and what they cannot have access to, right? Uh, here, if you wanna preserve ratio, that means it, the ratio just follow, it adjusts for them. But if our purpose, we want them to correct ratio or teach them ratio, we don't wanna do that. We can uh, go talk about keyboard editing, of course, um, enable dragging label, show icon reset construction, show them the menu, show the input bar, show the style bar, and then done. Once you're done with that, then you could save. And at this point, now you could go, um, sorry, test two here, sorry. Once you have it done, this is the activity that you created, right? Now, I wanna send it to my students. Right? So I create a class. Once you create a class on top, now I'm going to create a new class. And um, here I'm going to call it test two if you want. And you create. So now the students, you could just give them this code and they'll get to your activity and you'll get to see them come in. But now the other question is let's say, for example, you, need, you made a mistake, you want to add more question to it, right? You know, like Louise just joined my class, right? So let's say I, I have a problem and I need to, I could go back to the question and change it and automatically Louise is going to have the correction version. So I don't have to redo this process all the time. So you just do it once and they automatically, you know, and what you could do if you have an assignment that let's say you start off with a circle and then you want to move to a triangle and then you want to move to complex. You can keep on adding question on the same document. You don't have to keep on creating classes, right? So if let's say one class is geometry, which is only geometry. One is probability. You could have two folders, probability, geometry. You could have many assignments. You could have one assignment that it's keep on going. And in a way, it's not a bad idea because you could keep the traces of the progression also. Like look at Super Louise, like what she's doing, you know? She's showing off. She's so good. <laughs> I love your work. <laughs> you know, one day I'll get to do that. <laughs> so, um, so this is the idea. And I, I find GeoGebra is like impressive. There's so much to learn. And yes, Jessica, you're absolutely right. It is a lot of work, but it's worth the investment. Honestly, uh, if you take a, and they're so good in GeoGebra. This is the other part that I want to show you. They do have tutorial and I gave you here, I, I, I'm not gonna show you the video, but there's a whole video on, on, uh, on how to- Hello, my name is Carly Nelson. Sorry, and how to create the triangle step-by-step. Step. There's so many people that are invested in GeoGebra. They have so much instruction. So you could even give it to your student, you know, to do it. There's um, another thing that I came across, which I thought super cool. Uh, is also you have, I found a, a site where you could go and they'll show you step-by-step step how to do it. 
So for the people who need a visual, you have it. If you have, and this is good for, for, uh, for, for diverse learners. If you have a student that requires the step-by-step, you could do it in the instruction. Do this, do this, do this. If you have a student that is super good, just tell them, okay, create for me this shape that has four sides, this constriction, that constriction, and they could get so creative with this tool. So you could adjust it to all your student and you could work one-on-one -on -one while the whole class is working, give feedback, but the feedback, there's no traces. So they have to actually listen and actually do it themselves. So there's, it's, it's a very pedagogically, I find it an extraordinary program. But yes, it's new, like everything else uh, with the COVID-19, they have to learn exponential amount of software, but this one is worth the investment. Uh, that's on a personal note, but anyways. So here I, I, yeah. get, I gave you the solution and I gave you also a website that has lots of activities already prepared for you. So if you, if you let's say, don't want to create, but you want to get inspired, there's a lot of people who have libraries that is accessible, publicly accessible to everyone. You're, you, you could take it and use it and modify it and do whatever. C'est correct, Louise? Is it true? Yeah? Oui. Tu peux retourner voir ce que je t'ai fait dans ton activité. OK. Ah! Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is fun because the student could also... Oh, also one thing, Louise, um, and I'm, I'm, um, this is from... Uh, she inspired me. For students who are using a lot of virtual tools, Sometimes it's so monotonic because they have to do the work, right? You could put a twist by giving them the, allowing them to change their colors, to, uh, to make their, uh, let's say the, their canvas to their liking. If they don't want to have a white background, they could have it uh, quad, they could have it dotted, you could have a pattern, whatever. They could personalize. So that makes it even super cool. Yes, Julie. Sorry. <laughs> well, I was saying earlier that uh, I used to have Geo Sketchpad, but that was a software that I think the school had bought, and then they, they stopped the license, so I lost everything. Oh. So when I think GeoGebra is free, right? It's an online thing for free, and I don't think we need a license for it. So no. I think it's a little bit worth my time uh, more than an actual software that I might lose later on. Yeah. No, no, I really appreciate that point because we, I forgot to mention, you're absolutely right, Julie. This is a free, uh, it's a free software and it's uh, public. And if I'm not mistaken, Louise, correct me, please. Is it, uh, it's a university who, who, who sponsor it, right? C'est une université qui l'a qui créé? C'est un logiciel libre. Ah. Qui est une communauté qui font bénévolement des... Euh... To yeah, and, yeah. yeah, it's it's a, it's a it's an organization, a, a community that uh, the, the volunteers to put it out there to help people, like to help students learn. So, and and just to let you know, Louise is one of the people involved in this community for the translation of all the work in French. So you will see her name in a lot of activities everywhere. So she's our go-to, our guru, as Jojebra guru. <laughs> Michelin, is this something that you're seeing teachers use? Uh in the classroom often or, or to the teachers in the group? Are they currently using it in the classroom? Um, I don't know if in our group uh, people are using it. I don't know, Julie, Paul, uh, are you guys using it? Not, no, not yet. Not yet. Is it something you would consider using, Paul? Uh, yes, uh, right now my math resource is on Fridays and it's all remote. So now suddenly I can't use manipulatives and I can't have the student in front of me. I teach adults, so they're um, adept with being able to do certain things, but if they're, they're lacking in math skills or perhaps computer skills or computer technology at home, uh, it's making it challenging. Watch yeah. other and drawings and try to get them to see what I'm doing from my home. Yeah, yeah. No, this is, a, this is a common concern. A lot of people, uh, unfortunately, electronics uh, to our students is, is a problem. Some, uh, some schools are, are lucky enough to have 
tools to lend others unfortunately you have whatever your phone or and sometimes it's the wi-fi and it's it's complicated i know i know has um in the french sector have they aligned activities with the DBE program. I'm, I'm thinking that would be a great thing to do on our on the income sector as well. If we were to choose like a, you know, 4151, let's say, and design provincially um, activities like this that we could all use in the classroom. I think that'd be in a the great French, project. Yeah, in the French sector, there's a lot of things going on already. Like GeoGebra is used, I mean, uh, Louise could speak for the French uh, community, but I, I, I know from a lot of the places that I, I've been and I, I participated, GeoGebra is second nature. And uh, Desmos also is very, very used. So yeah. Desmos is GeoGebra. Uh, in the English community, I guess it's pockets. It's still mm -hmm. not very popular. Uh, but like everything, it's like something new. Uh, I think the more people will be aware of its use and its potential, the more it'll become beneficial, I think. And yes, it could be something we can do provincially to, to, to align the curriculum uh, with the, but already it exists. A lot of content exists. That is already exists. It's, it's already. a matter of aligning it with our, yeah. with our so, program. Yeah. Yeah, Julie. I'm guessing there's a possibility to do some animations in there. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That would be fun to play with. Do you oh. want to, uh, something really, really cool? Um, Louise also showed me, um, of course, she's my teacher right now. Um, you could bring in graspable math into GeoGebra, which is impressive because you will have two windows, one where you could do completely your calculation and then you'll have the other side, you'll have all the graphing, which is like, you can ask, like, if you're from a different area, you're like, which is our youngsters are from there now. And like, everybody's electronically inclined and less and less paper, pencil. I think Jojeba could, could cover it all. And just a little secret between us, uh, we, I am on a team that we were looking at long this remote evaluation we are using GeoGebra. So again, it's still primitive. We're figuring it out because it is going to move towards that eventually. Okay, just to let you know. So yeah. Um, so just to go back here, I know this is <laughs> so interesting. So the, the best way to make, to, to, to make a tool really worthwhile is actually to use it and not to use it once in a while, to use it regularly, to make it part of the, 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 the lesson plan, that to have that five minute on that tool, because the more you use it, the better you get at it. If it's just once in a blue moon, it's gonna be once in a blue moon, it's gonna be put back on the shelf. Personally, I think the more you use something, the more it'll be, it'll be second nature if it's used often enough, okay? So that being said, again, how do you choose these activities? Again, having a, a clear goal in mind, a math goal in mind, again, then you'll be able to build your activity accordingly. Just remember something, uh, Bloom Taxonomy, you may see it in two different ways. It was revised in the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in the 80s, uh, in the 2000s, sorry. And um, the value, uh, the, the re-evaluation was just really to flip and flop the top part, okay? They moved from uh, uh, an uh, adjective or uh, an adjective form to a more verb form, an action form, which is to match the competencies. And they felt that creating should be the highest metacognitive uh, uh, action, right? So you'll, you may see it sometimes, evaluation synthesis, or uh, that, that's the old bloom. The new bloom, the revised bloom, you may have uh, noticed here from evaluation is to creating, from synthesis to evaluating. Analysis is an analysis, and the rest is the same, okay? So just to give you uh, this. And of course, uh, art of questioning is at the base of everything that guides our practice. The more instead of answering a question, start with a question 
and and give the chance the 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 trick is to give the chance to the student to actually reflect so these are these are kind of higher order math questions. I have a whole document on it that I, I provided you as a reference if you want. So here, a uh, question to get started, question, uh, questions to check progress. You have questions at the end of a lesson. Okay, so these again, these are references um, of, of, of type of question if let's say to inspire you more than anything, of course, right? So um, this will be uh, with the presentation and you'll have the website for it. And this is all um, this is all part of the package you'll get. And of, of course, I, I sometimes, you know, always sometimes uh, it's always nice to leave something uh, with us is to understand is to reinvent what Piaget referred to. And I think my my little addition to this, choosing the way to facilitate the magic is up to us. Okay. Now, this is the last part of the, the, the presentation that I would like to share with you. Uh, this is all stuff that you will be taking home with you today. So I sound like a salesman right now. Okay, so first one, is uh, I created the progression of learning for all of these courses. I did not include time and sense and space, but everything is there. Again, this is not an official one. This is a homemade one, right? Um, with the essential knowledge and the new compulsory knowledge for every level, for every course, okay? So notice here for the B113, you're starting from there. So technically there's nothing you're bringing into the, the, the plate, right? But let's say we move on to um, another course. Uh, let's say for example here, the, the math uh, 103, the, the pre-secondary. These are all your prerequisites technically, and these are all your new, new, uh, new content to learn. And I did that for all of our courses. So you could see the connection of, of uh, what your previous course is bringing into the to the table so just and we to have an idea been very busy oh i've been busy yes <laughs> i'm trying to do whatever i can to help because i would have loved to have this when i was planning my courses because the this section here the essential knowledge would have been my uh, my how can i say mise à niveau like uh, like uh, the um the uh, placement test, if you want. So just so I could get a feel, where do I have to review? But I did not, like, usually I just do a random one. And sometimes I miss, like, oh, they've seen this before. They've seen this before. So this also gives me a feel of how it's evolving. A concept evolves, like, for every level. Okay, here they see it this way, but there they see it this way. So technically, by sec three, they're supposed to see it like this. So I'm going to focus to make sure that it's aligned with it, right? So the planning becomes... This is a guide. It's not what I use to plan, but at least it gives me an idea where I'm going with the topic. So I thought it would be useful if you need it. This is the fun part. I'm gonna show you this. And this, I promise you, it took me a long, long time to put together, but with pleasure. Uh, I gave you here in-class activities, okay, and links to these. And I give you virtual resources and links to these. So. In class activities, of course, you'll notice I gave you all the documentation for the three project that it's yours to use. Feel free, they're mine. Please have fun with them. Now, the second part after these, these are activities. And this is where I actually was looking at research and seeing what available and ways of actually engaging the student to see if we, if we could put that reflecting part and that thinking part in place, just ideas for you to kind of maybe get inspired by. So the activity uh, number one that I thought was really neat is which one doesn't belong, right? So you'll notice you have four shape and there's all right answers. It depends. Each student will see it differently. They may say, okay, well, this rectangle doesn't belong. This triangle now doesn't belong. And they'll have to justify. So look at the shape of up. What do you notice? Which one doesn't belong and why? And you may use these strategies. So you could actually encourage them here to say, okay, let's explain what your choice through a strategy. And this is a fun one because you could use many strategies to explain, right? So this is one way and a, a little twist to it could be find the reason why each one doesn't belong. 
So now you're kind of twisting the student's thinking. Now, okay, if I take the first one, it doesn't belong because it's upside down. I don't know, you know? So you're making them think further. You're not asking to resolve. So now we're thinking, right? Now, the same thing for this one here, uh, find a reason why each one doesn't belong. They're all money, but they have different maybe shapes, size, whatever, you know? Uh, again, the same thing here. These, I gave three examples. There's a list of, I think if I'm not making like a hundred of these and you could get them, uh, you know, to, to reflect on. The three act, I love the three acts. The three acts, what it is, is you give them situation. Like I give them my tool. So here, this is an exercise and activity on, on circles and circum, uh, circumference. So you'll give them different object that you're measuring circumference with and you give them a distance. And actually at the end, you give them, you show them the solution and you say, well, the, the question is, is either tire is to hit the target? What do, you, uh, what do you wonder and notice? So they have to actually think about it. Well, if I take this tire over here, how many turn will it take to hit? Like they'll have to like think of ways to figure out the answer, but without you telling them, Oh, well, the circumference is like actually one turn, right? So they'll they'll they could play with it, they could think about it, they could simulate it. And actually, what's so cool about the three act, there's a whole library with videos with the solution at the end. So it could be like the, the grand finale reveal, you know, and you could like do it as a class, give it as a problem, let them just simmer with it, you know, give it and say, okay, on Friday, we'll we'll tackle it. So it'll simulate. So it gives something a little spice to your class, right? Like I love what Julie said about the competition component. This could be a really, really cool. Um, another activity, which I thought super interesting. I know it may sound a bit babyish, but believe me, it's super interactive. It's called the clothesline activity. What you do is you'll have two clothesline and this would be super cool for students who struggle because you're bringing it apart and it's spatial so they could physically see it touch it and and move things around so what you do is you hang in your classroom to you know like clothesline and what you do on one you could put the unit and on the like at the beginning you put the unit so there's a portion that you say okay this is always going to be the unit now in a problem like that uh, the, 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 the person, this, this problem comes from um, this teacher and he goes to buy frozen yogurt and he bought 10 ounces of frozen yogurt that costed him $4. Now his wife likes more ice cream and she bought 12.5 ounces. What is, how much is going to cost? And then you can build on that. Well, if we all look at our money together in this class, how much can we buy? Like, and you can build it and you could leave it there. And that could be a problem of the day, problem of the week. If you want to look at maybe conversion, you could put kilometers and meters and put numbers and ask them like, if this equals this, then how much is this? Or you could just put any problem displayed there and let their, they could hang their answers. You know, you, they could turn it upside down and at the end of the, the, let's say the week or the class, you could reveal the answers and take a look. And like that will be anonymous and everybody participates. So it's a bit of an interactive kind of um, activity. Of course, here, when we're talking about interpretation of data, instead of giving them a graph and say, okay, tell me, tell me uh, what does it say? You could play around differently. Uh, telling them using the number one to six, Use the number, using the number only once, create a graph by filling in the blank. But the blanks are usually uh, relations. If there's so many bananas, so many apples, so many oranges, but we know we have a max uh, from one to six, right? And there is so much more apple than bananas. There's so much less than bananas. And there are more oranges than bananas. So they have to create a combination that will answer that. And from there, then you could create your graph. So it's pretty cool because there's many solution to this. Uh, the same thing here, I give you two. Tangrams are super interesting. A problem like that was used, actually I was inspired for, if I'm not mistaken, from uh, Berkeley, from the Frankenstein Institute. And what they do is they give them a tangram, they ask them to measure the angles, and then they give them the measurement of uh, the size of one uh, shape and they ask them to kind of find all the sizes, you know, of, of, uh, of each shape. 
And once they do that, they ask them to create a shape, right? And from there, then for them to realize that whatever shape they created, they will all have the same area, right? Which is super, super neat uh, realization. It's actually a really cool one. Um, this one is another one for math, um, math conversation. I know we're coming close to the end. I promise you I'm almost done. Uh, this one I thought was super cool. This is, you put a picture, it's a, it's a library of pictures, and you just add, let the student roll on what kind of question you may wonder. So it's more for the, like the questioning, you have to question a problem. So something like this, how many shopping cart across is in the circle? Somebody may say, well, oh, uh, it's a, uh, what's the area of the circle? I wonder what's the circumference of the circle? So you'll have a, a, a generation of questions, you know, about an image. So uh, it develops the questioning aspect of students. This is another one which I thought super cool. Here, instead of asking for area and, and surface area, you could say, well, um, you have identical four squares. Which one will contain, uh, let's say, the most, uh, um, in this case, uh, which one has the most blue? Which one has the least uh, white? Which one has the most white? You know, and get them to think, you know? So, uh, so that's for with this. Now we get to the virtual and in the virtual, I got you like uh, number spinners, uh, uh, missing angles, probability reading bar chart, uh, adjustable spinners, uh, geo boards. This is cool for you, Julie. This is a really neat one. Uh, pattern blocks, tangrams, geo boards again, manipulative, GeoGebra, library shapes. Uh, um, these are all uh, GeoGebra activity, a, li a library for that. So this is this is all something you could use to your discretion. Um, the question you'll have, uh, you know, the the questioning, the art of questioning, you'll have access to that document also. The newsletter, of course, anything new, uh, anyone that donates a a, a pretest, an activity, I'll be mentioning it in it, and uh, of course the age resources. That's where we're gonna house. Uh, most of the thing. So I hope you guys had a better understanding of, uh, of uh, math goals and how they could help target the learning. And I recognize the benefit of visualization and you'll enjoy the library. And um, I always like to have a, a follow-up just because I wanna see if you ever try to use any of these uh, material, how did it go? If there's something like some feedbacks more for me, some feedback for the community, if there's something we could do better, okay? And we put it again on April 9th from 12 to one, uh, from 12 to one, if you want. Worst case scenario, come for a discussion, More not more than that. And uh, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this. <laughs>